in meditation, you always have a mantra, right? You have a mantra, you have a mantra. It's just something you say to yourself uh, while you're meditating that kind of helps you throughout the day. If I'm in the gym, you know, I don't know. Like I just kind of say to myself, like, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. I kind of stole that from this UFC fighter. (laughs) She says it all the time. But I would say that with the thought of like beating alcoholism. I'm the best. I'm the best. I'm the best. Kind of like when people will have a rubber band on their wrist and they'll just slap it if they get that urge or something. That's kind of my thing. And that if I just keep saying that I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best, like it goes away, you know, but I have to do that a million times a day. I have to do it all. And sometimes I'm saying this out loud and I'm thinking, are these people hearing me say this? (laughs) Welcome to the Family Addiction Coaching Podcast. My name is Patrick Doyle. I am one of only 22 certified craft clinicians in the United States, a family addiction coach, and a social worker with 30 years experience in the addiction and mental health fields. From this series, you'll learn insider tips and strategies to best help a loved one with addiction gain health and recovery. You will also learn how to improve your family's overall quality of life. Let's get started. It's recording guys yay recording all right all right i'm just gonna do this intro then and then we'll just uh get right into Good it idea. over there hey everyone my name is amanda i'm a patient advocate and recovery from addiction and i'm guest hosting because patrick the founder of this podcast called me recently very excited very proud that his son mike stopped drinking without the help of a program tough love methods or typical treatment which is pretty amazing He's been eager to share his son's success, and since I'm in recovery and share my story, I thought it'd be a good idea to talk to Mike and Patrick together to hear a father and son perspective. So I'm thrilled to have both the Doyle men here with me today. Hey, Mike, how are you? Glad to be here. Thanks. Doing good. Good. And we also have the founder of this podcast and Mike's dad, Patrick Doyle, Family Addiction Coaching. Hey, Patrick. Hey, Amanda. Hey, Mike. How are you guys doing today? Doing good. Doing good. Good. Thank you guys for taking the time. so exciting. Thank you both for having the time to have this conversation. So, Mike, let's start with you. How's it feel to share on your dad's podcast? Because this has to be a little weird, I guess, or fun. Uh, I I don't think so, because... um, you know, him and I have talked about this, you know, kind of endlessly, uh, not endlessly, but like a, a lot, you know, he's always been an easy guy to talk to about uh, certain kinds of issues, you know, uh, I've always felt comfortable about, uh, you know, these kind of things, especially addiction, since he's a specialist, this is his field, you know, so I have no problem with that. He's never been like judgy about it, you know, like I've had my fair share of issues very you know, up and down since I was, I don't know, 17, 18 years old. I'm 35 now. I've got a solid, like, <laughs> almost 20 years of drinking under my belt. I've, uh, you know, gone elsewhere too. That has never been a problem like drinking was for me. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm i totally open to uh, talk about anything. Cool. Yeah, I, I kind of wondered, like, because he's an addiction expert, if that made it somewhat intimidating you know to say something to him because I thought about like I tried to put myself in your shoes with what I know of your dad and he's so like understanding and he's such a good listener and so empathetic and I'm not really used to older folks being like that not that your dad is old he's gonna kill me but you know somebody who's (laughs) like around my parents age and I mean I couldn't say anything to my parents I hid my use for years, like 15 years. So they, you know, I mean, they handled it well, but yeah. So I was curious how, uh, how easy it was to say something to him. And it, it's, yeah, nice. I, I mean, I would, I would always say that he's kind of like been a progressive guy, you know, like just, uh, always looking for new ideas, you know, not kind of set in stone. Uh, if there's new information, he'll change his opinion, you know, that kind of thing. And when you have that kind of a mindset of a thinker, you know, like they kind of say that there's two kinds of people, right? There's a, a thinker and a, a strategist, you know, strategist is always thinking about how to, what they're going to say to react. Thinker will use, you know, new information and create a new opinion, very, uh, a, a, a liberal mind, you know, not in a political sense, but just liberal meaning, you know, open, open. So, uh, I think that always, that's something 
that I would say someone in his field should always be. Uh, you know, I've gone to, uh, you know, therapy. I've gone to different, um, you know, I went to, uh, what do you call it? Like 12 step program. I did that like one or two times, but it was very Jesus-y. I didn't like that. Uh, and then what was the, and then the one I did right before the pandemic, um, there's that, smart recovery. What's that? Yeah. Smart recovery. That, yeah. One? Yeah. that one was pretty good, you know, but it's, it, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I mean, back to the original point, if, if you have a liberal kind of progressive mind, there's, you're always going to accept new ideas and it's exciting too. It's, there's nothing worse than be stuck in the mud, especially mentally. Uh, so yeah, it's always easy to talk to about this kind of thing. I'll say that. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. I, I didn't really even think about that. I mean, I get debates of, in debates with my parents all the time and it's like just trying to, you know, just change their mind a little bit, just give them a little bit of information they know, but they're set pretty much. And uh, yeah, your dad's not like that at all. Yeah. And it, it's, it's a, just cause he's exposed to it. This is his career. This is his life, you know, and just some people aren't as understanding or they just don't get it. You know, if, if you haven't experienced addiction or you're not in the field. A lot of people just don't get it. Um, my mother is understanding, but in a different way. She doesn't. She doesn't understand how I feel quite as much. My wife also just doesn't get it. My wife is very so, like I said, thinker and strategist. I'm a thinker. She's very much a strategist in how she talks and how she goes about things. And for her, if she doesn't want to drink, she won't drink for months. She'll just say, you know, I don't like how I feel after a gin martini last night. I'm not going to drink for the next three months. And boom, it's like that. She just shuts it right off. Yeah, she can do that. And I mean, that's her personality and like that works for her. So she doesn't necessarily get just the (laughs) rigorous battle that is in my brain 24 hours a day. Just a constant anxiety, you know? Yeah, a lot of people really don't get it dealt with people for years like that even on the health care level of things i've dealt with judgment and you know being kicked out of doctor's offices and all sorts of stuff it's been fun but (laughs) your dad's a pretty good person it's awesome that you had that i like i know a little bit about your story but only what he shared with me which is just kind of highlights and you know that you're in new york and you went to fashion school and you got married and um, that you uh, were looking to like stand up during COVID and stuff. But like, what was your journey? Would you say to stop drinking? Like what happened with that? Um, so I would say, Hmm. I would say I've always a very typical reason for drinking kind of a social lubricant, you know, I, I do, I, I consider myself more of an introvert than an extrovert. It does help, you know, if I'm with the right crowd, I'm very extroverted, but if I'm not, you know, a couple of martinis always helps. So that was that. And I just, I mean, it was just a gradual thing over years and years and years. And I've always been kind of a, uh, like a binge drinker, like a guy who would, you know, it, w- it would either be a, a long weekend of drinking or even, you know, a couple of months period of flunk drinking. And then I have been able to, at certain points, just shut it off. 2016 was the first time that I took some like legit time off. One of my buddies who I grew up with, he took a month off. Like he did a sober January, you know, a very common yeah. thing. And when he told me that I was shocked, I could not believe it. And I was like, wow, that's really good. Like that's, that's pretty cool. If, if this, if this guy could do it, I can easily do it. <laughs> so like I took a month off uh, and then I got back to it. And then later in the year, I took like six weeks off before my birthday, before I turned 30. And I felt great during those times, but I always went back. And another thing was my tolerance never changed. Like huh. I remember on so like I said, I took six weeks off before my 30th birthday. So that night I turned 30, like I was like, like itching, you know? And right. like, I got like a pint of uh Woodford reserve, one of my favorite bourbons also doesn't help that I'm just like a really, really much a whiskey guy. <laughs> and like, I, I 
I, I work in this industry. I work in the service industry too. Yeah, so yeah, it's, like it's, it's my job to know about this and sell this stuff and to, you know, so I, I know a lot about alcohol just in general, uh, which adds just another area of how difficult it is to stop. But so anyway, that night I got a pint of Woodford Reserve bourbon, my favorite bourbon, and I drank it in like an hour and I was like unfazed. Damn. Like unfazed. And that was after six weeks of no drinking. And I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> this is strange. Like typically if people take time off, you know, they'll have one drink and then they're like loopy. They fall asleep. They right. go to bed. You know, that's what I was thinking. And so that's when I kind of realized that, you know, I don't know if I have a, I don't know what this is, but I have a, I have a very high tolerance. I don't know if it's just from years of drinking, uh, you know. So then, uh, I don't know. There's just been other times where I took a couple weeks off, you know, a uh, month off. And then I started realizing, like, I don't know. It was always kind of a problem. Like, I did get a DUI in, like, 2011. Yeah. So yeah, that, was, that was a big thing, you know. Um, and like that upset my mother so much. And like, I took time off from drinking after that, but I didn't necessarily think like I should like quit, you know, and just, and just the thought of quitting was always just so monumental, you know? And then, so that happened then, I don't know if you want to fast forward to like right now, when I most recently had like three or four months where I didn't drink, uh, that was helped a lot by was a recovering alcoholic and he would kind of see how I struggle. So he would say like, you know, and we would have honest talks cause he, he hadn't had a drink in like three years and it really derailed his career. Uh, and then like him and I would talk a lot and you know, he kind of helped me to, he would be like, dude, like you need to change something up. It could hurt your career. Look at mine. Like, mm-hmm. and it really derailed his life. And he had a lot of knowledge to distill on me. And because of that, I was like, you know, I should really clean myself up. A really motivating thing. Uh, so I didn't have anything three or four months. Uh, you know, the gym has always helped me a lot. Keep me clean, keep me focused. Um, and then around four months, I had an injury in the gym. I hurt my back. I could barely move. Wow. Uh, I couldn't go to the gym. And then, you know, the old uh, demons come back a lot right. easier. When, yep, I can- when I can't put my, you know addiction like if i can't put it into the because that's just my brain i've just accepted it if i can't put it into how i work out i don't know it's got to go somewhere yeah you don't know where to put it almost it's like what do you do yeah exactly so then i uh you know i kind of got back into it uh rougher than before you know for a month or two and then now you know, my back healed up and I was like, I don't want to live like this. I don't want like, I don't feel good. I'm very, I'm also a very vain person. So if I start noticing, you know, I'm getting like a beer gut or like a, I don't really drink beer, but uh, if I'm just getting like an alcohol stomach, I'm like, this is ridiculous. I don't want to look like that. I like how I look when I'm in the gym all the time. I need to fix this. So now I'm like last Tuesday, like I'm like, I don't know, 10 days or so. I haven't had a drink, which has been great. Um, but that's just, again, just out of, you know, sheer will, um, and the gym being the great equalizer of me not drinking. Yeah. What do you, like, what do you, do you have anything that you tell yourself in your head? Like anytime you think about drinking, does it even cross your mind? Like when you're able to go to the gym and stuff, is there? Oh, all all the time, all the time. So like I kind of said earlier, it's just, it's a continuous anxiety all day long all day long anytime something you know i'm not a very confrontational guy and i have to be very confrontational in my job whether it be with employees with vendors with ownership um the neighbors upstairs who hate the noise we're making (laughs) yeah all of these kind of things confront 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 and that's not really my nature Mm -hmm. i have to do it and if I have a couple of drinks, it's a lot easier for me to be confrontational. So, I mean, that's that's always been something that's been, uh, you know, kind of hard to deal with. So what do you, is there anything that like you 
tell yourself to oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's that's what the question was yeah. uh so so like lately in the gym like especially this last time i will kind of so i have like kind of a background in meditation too and in in meditation you always have a mantra right you have a mantra you have a mantra it's just something you say to yourself uh while you're meditating that kind of helps you throughout the day if i'm in the gym uh you know i don't know like i just kind of say to myself like I'm the best. I'm the best. I'm the best. And like in the, in, I kind of stole that from this UFC fighter. <laughs> she says it all the time. And, but I would say that with the thought of like beating alcoholism, I'm the best. I'm the best. I'm the best. Kind of like when people will have a rubber band on their wrist and they'll just slap it. If yeah. they get that urge or something, that's kind of my thing. And that if I just keep saying that I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best, like it goes away, you know, but I have to do that. A million times day. a day. Yeah. I have to do it all. And sometimes I'm saying this out loud and I'm thinking, are these people hearing me say this? <laughs> I sound like a complete lunatic. <laughs> so, so, I mean, that's kind of, I mean, that's what I'm doing right now. Who knows how long it's going to work, but it's kind of working right now. Yeah. If it's working, that's all that really mm. matters. I would think too, like after a while, it, you know, you, you'd be able to say it less to yourself. Like I would think that you would manage it you know better as time goes on i mean that's how it was for me i am i didn't drink but uh i don't even remember what i told myself like it's been so long that i don't even really think about oh no i do remember actually i tell myself like no you don't want to do that you'll disappoint your family like everybody will be so upset with you you're better than that you can do it don't even think about it what are you doing that's yeah yeah, that's what i tell myself yeah i i have to like i have to kind of like these things like i'm the best i'm trying to like psych myself into thinking this you know that's that's kind of why i'm saying it and like i'll say it in the mirror i'll go in the mirror and i'll say it until i believe it and i i do think when i'm when i'm motivating i when i'm motivated i have a very very strong will and you know, and if I want to do something, I can typically do it kind of like when I, when I got into fashion, when I moved to New York kind of out of nowhere and I was, you know, decently successful for a a short amount of time. Like if I, if I, if I want to do it, if I really want to, and I have a goal, another thing is just the goal entirely. And like when I did that, no drinking three to four months, I didn't really have a goal. And I was thinking, like, is this going to be forever? I know my life would be better if I just never drank again. But the the levity of being forever, yeah, like it, it was it was too much. And so it's when heavy. I did, yeah, so when I did get back to drinking, I drank really heavily. So right now, I only told myself that I'm not going to drink for a month. I'm going to go back to like the kind of the smaller the smaller thoughts of like what worked for me in 2016. Like I talked about before I have, you know, this workout plan that I'm doing that is four or five weeks long. I'm doing that. I have my supplements. I have enough supplements for four to five weeks. You know, I'm going to get jacked to the gills and (laughs) that's, and I'm going to drink a lot of water, a lot of, I'm going to eat a lot of protein and I'm not going to have like sweets. I'm not going to do nothing for a month because I'm the best. 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 And so it's a little easier right now in this shorter time frame. I don't know what I'm going to do after a month, but at least for right now, this is kind of, I think it's kind of working for me. It seems to be. And this is totally off topic, but when you're talking about your workout program, it reminded me of my husband's workout program, which helps keep him sane. And we now have a gym in our garage and he does some five, three, one something program, but it's like, it's, it's longer than four or five weeks. Like he goes on and on. So you could just adopt a longer program. Or yeah. 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 You know? I mean, maybe I, yeah, if, if it, I don't know, also it's just about structure and the gym adds structure to my life. And if I yeah. have a longer structure, yeah, it will work for a longer amount of time. It's, yeah. I don't know. Just for right now, I'm I'm trying to just focus on four or five weeks. Yeah, that's getting, good. Getting through that and seeing where I go from there. Yeah. Um. So, did you talk to your dad? Like, do you remember what you said to him when you, uh, you know, when you kind of realized you were struggling, or like, was there a moment when you called him up and? Did you guys have like that talk? Like, Hey dad, so I, you know, 
or did did he just kind of know the whole time and you guys like this kept this in touch? most recent time? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I told him through text. Uh, I didn't tell him for a while, just because, like, like you said, it's kind of you know, not shameful, but it's like I let myself down. I felt, and I didn't really want to put that on anybody else either. I'm I'm also someone who likes to internalize pain, <laughs> big time. Um, I don't like people to feel my pain. I I know that. You know, deep down, I know you, you don't get anywhere without help, you know, but I don't like to. I don't ask know. I just help. Yeah, I don't like to ask for help. Yeah, I don't like yeah. to. I don't like to. Even in regular life, like in 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 management, I manage many, many people. My a skill I'm not great at is delegation, even though that's supposed to be like the number one thing. A lot of times if people just let me down i will just be like you know what f this i'm doing this myself you're useless i can't trust you i'm gonna do it myself because i can always you know i don't know count on myself to get that work done and it's the same thing kind of with uh uh, i guess internalizing pain um i don't like to i don't like to talk to anybody about it um i i just don't I don't feel comfortable. Um, I don't think it's any like deep rooted male misogyny thing, but it's just, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with it. I don't want to, I want to be tough. Right. You know, you don't want to burden anybody with your problems. Yeah. I, I have this tendency where I don't, um, like I don't let my parents know if I'm doing something or friends or anything until I've actually done it. Absolutely. Because in the past, I used to be like, oh, I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to go here and do this. And then I wouldn't do it and I would fall through and I learned to not <laughs> even mention it. Oh, you know? that's so much like me because yeah. I would, you know, like if you see like uh, someone on social media, like a lot of, I, I'm not really on Facebook anymore, but when I was on Facebook, there's a lot of like my hometown, you know, friends on Facebook and they would post something like, I got this job interview coming up. Right. Yeah. And then, and then they just don't say anything ever again, but they got, but they got a bunch of likes on their stupid post and like, they didn't get the job. And like, that was enough for them just to get the attention of like, you know, cross your fingers for me. And then everyone comments, you got this, you go girl, you know, like these kind of stupid, meaningless nothings. And whenever I would see that, it, it would just infuriate me, you know, like, don't talk, like you said, don't talk about it until it's done. It, it's yeah. And I it was like, I never want to be that. I don't know, kind of person. I don't know if that's really on topic, but I, I don't think it is. I reject. Mean- yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it is my show, right? <laughs> uh, I, well, I'm just, I mean, this is fascinating to listen to. And Amanda, I really appreciate you leading this, interviewing us. And it allows me to just sit back and take everything all in. You're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. So one question came up into my mind, Mike, the not wanting to reach out for help and then literally not reaching out for the help probably 99.99% of the time. Do you think that works for you? Do you think it doesn't work for you or maybe sometimes yes, sometimes no? Um, I would say it never, never works. It, it, it never works so not reaching out for help. It, it works against you. Absolutely. It, it hinders you. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, it it, it does. It's, uh, I know it's, uh, I don't, I don't know if you would call it a character flaw, but it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's not easy for me. I know it's not easy for anybody, but I don't like to, I like to be light. Um, most of the time, my job is very stressful. Um, just life itself is very, stressful you think of uh you know i i go on twitter every day and there's like fun things that i see but most of it is about you know horrible politics and like this all all this stuff is so massively depressing right 
Um, so when I talk to friends and family, I like to be light. I I like to have fun. I like to crack jokes. You know, with these people in my life, I don't want to like, I don't want that negativity of, you know, the world in there. I like to joke around. I like to talk about lifting weights. I like to talk about pro wrestling. Uh, I like, you know, I like jokes. I like very politically incorrect things. I, I like to just pop people, make them laugh, you know, like that's how I prefer to spend my time with people I like or love. Well, let me, uh, and that's totally understandable. I mean, I guess that's just kind of like human nature, you know, like who wouldn't want to talk about, you know, things that we like and that amuse us or entertain us or make us feel good. Um, so it's very human. If you do choose to speak out about a difficulty that you're having, how do you feel after that? Do you feel better? Do you feel the same? Do you feel worse? I, I, I always feel better. I know I always feel better. This kind of reminds me of something that you taught me growing up, uh, how life is like 90% showing up and you always kind of it's always going to be worse in your head, right? I'll say this. I won't speak specifically about the issue, but with my mother, I had a conversation with her a couple months ago that I was waiting to, that I did not talk about for literally 10 years. Um, a problem that I had with her for 10 years, I never brought it up. Because, you know, I didn't want to put that, my pain on her. You know, with both of you, with you, with my mother, you guys, I had a great childhood. I look at my childhood very fondly. You guys did everything you could have possibly done. I could not ask for better parents in childhood, you know? Everybody messes yeah. up. Everybody has these things where they didn't, you know, they just, I don't know, they just messed up. Everybody messes up. So I have never been one to want to talk to either of you about an issue that I have with you guys. Because I look at my childhood so fondly and I think I've grown up to be a pretty good person because of you guys. So... 10 years, <laughs> I literally sat for 10 years with this uh, kind of pain and anger about something that happened. And eventually, you know, I just talked to her about it. And the conversation, the conversation went a billion times better than I thought it would. So we had this conversation and she took it a billion times better than I thought she would. It wasn't like that at all. She was like, because I was like, I don't, I don't know if tough is the right word, but I was like, uh, I, I don't know if you like could handle hearing this. And she was like, I'm your mother. I can totally handle it. Like, this is fine. Like, that's a really good I intro. That's a, that's a good way to, pardon me. That's a really good way to introduce a difficult conversation, you know, by testing the waters. Like you just said, I don't know if you're going to want to hear this. And you check out her reaction, and then that guides you as to you know how far you're going to pursue it further. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. So, and how did you feel after you had that difficult conversation? It was good. It felt good. It like I was happy how she received it. I thought she was going to receive it very poorly. Uh, it went really well, and so you, know, you were glad. You were glad that you chose to have that difficult conversation yeah of course oh that's good yeah so that and you were surprised i was massively surprised yeah yeah it had to like lift a whole bunch of weight off your shoulders too i imagine yeah for sure for sure it's also just like i mean i just i just do this like in general um even like going back to my dui right so i had some I had some like fees that I had to pay. Yeah, I've had to know? pay those fees. Yeah. yeah, but then like at the time I was like this happened just before I moved to New York, 
just before I was getting into fashion school, I signed my life away with these student loans. I had no money. Uh, and it was a very stressful time. And there were just like a few, like a few hundred dollars of loans that not loans of, uh, like fees, wh- whether it was court fees or, you know, the, uh, the class fees that I had to go through. I, I can't even remember exactly what it was, um, that I just couldn't afford to pay. And then eventually I saw, <laughs> I saw that there was a warrant out for me in Massachusetts. Yeah. So I'm in New York and like, I saw that. And then of course I'm petrified about it. Right. And I was like, so if I go to court to like, try to pay these fees, are they just going to like lock me up? Am I going to jail? Like, what is <laughs> like, what's, what's going to happen? I didn't know. So you know what I did? I avoided it for 10 years. This is an, <laughs> this is unrelated to the, my mother thing, but wow. I avoided paying that going to the you know Massachusetts court for 10 years for fear of what could possibly happen. Well, one time I called the court like a couple years before and they said to me like I asked them like what's going to happen and they were like I don't know. <laughs> and I was like, okay, it took me 8 years to call uh work up the courage to call to see what would happen. And they're like I don't know, but you got to show up here in court. I don't know what's going to happen. And I was like, okay, you know, f that. Uh, and then two years later, uh, so this would be then 2021, uh, I muster up the courage again to call. And this time, whoever I talked to was a lot more infor- informed and was like, you know what, you're just, if you have the money, you're going to have to pay these fees and then you'll be on your way. And I was like, oh, wow, it's really that easy. And so I went. Um, and yeah, I had to show up in court. There was like, you know, I don't know, six hundred, seven hundred dollars worth of fees. I'm a little better off now with money than I was back then. Uh and I sat I stood before the judge and like we just like talked for like five minutes. It was like the most relaxed thing in the world. And he's like, Oh, you just got these fees? Okay, yeah, just pay these off in the probation department and then you're free to go. Oh, Holding on, repressing avoiding. repressing things, things that make me drink. Living with things for years and years and years living with this baggage right like avoiding the confrontation yes when i could have just you know done this 10 years ago right and gotten out of the way and lived a more peaceful life where i possibly didn't have to drink so much right like carrying stuff that i mean it just weighs you down that you could have freed yourself from a long time ago you know exactly as we get older though i feel like we learn this stuff and we just learn to free ourselves and you seem to vent pretty good too i've noticed just in the group text that we've had like you vent pretty easily that's huge coping skill i think i I vent all the time so yeah i do i do vent but i have (laughs) like so much anger that it's it's only like the small amount like it may seem like a lot i don't know there's a lot more i don't know if that has anything to I think it helps. I I tell people that I'm venting. I'm like, I just need to vent for you for with you for a second, you know. And then I just lay it all out there, and I'm like, thank you for listening to me vent. You know, I just get it out of my system, and uh, it frees me from all that, like carrying it in and holding it in. Because sometimes it takes more energy to like hold that stuff in and be angry about something. Of course, it, you know, than it does to just let it out and try to talk about it. But right, yeah. How has this been for you, Patrick? Like you guys live in states apart and everything. What have you done to try to help and support Mike through all this? I mean, with you being an addiction expert and being in the field for so long, I mean, you have, there's so many resources and all this education that you've had and, and all the families that you deal with and, and through your work and stuff. I mean, just how did you choose how to, you know, support him and, I mean, basically my job is to give these kids and I've got two of them, give them as good a start in life as I can, while at the same time trying to balance my own, you know, self-care and career and relationships, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's always been kind of obvious. Let my kids know that I want to hear from them about anything that they want to tell me even if it's a problem or if it's um, a concern or something serious, I want to hear about it. 
while at the same time, I don't want them to feel like they owe me anything. They didn't ask to be brought into the world, you know? I brought them into the world, so I feel like I've got the responsibility to do anything I can do to, I mean, hopefully at some point, you know, they're glad that they were with us. Um, so that's always been the number one priority. So I've always tried to be open and talk to my kids and talk about sometimes serious things. We always love Mr. Rogers. What's that show that Katie used to watch all the time? Barney. Barney the <laughs> Dinosaur. <laughs> so, and I mean, these shows are really positive and they give kids and families really, you know, positive ideas about feelings and love and everything. So I, I just tried to help out any way that I can. So when I've, I hear that my kid has had a problem, whether it was like four years old and not wanting to go to a birthday party because they were anxious, I would stay there at the party with them in, um, or it, and, or any other kind of event. Um, you know, some other parents might hear about that kind of thing or, you know, go into a birthday party when the kids are really young and they don't want their parents to leave. And, you know, they start crying when we're leaving. And so I would stay and, you know, just and see if it was be easier to leave in five or 10 minutes later, or maybe it wouldn't be easier to leave. Sometimes I could leave. Sometimes I didn't. Um, uh, so I always try to respond to whatever my kids' needs were. And some parents out there might hear about that and say that, oh, I don't know, that I was enabling, that I was not teaching my kids to be self-reliant, that I was babying them, that kind of thing. Or like a helicopter um, parent or something. Yeah, 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 a helicopter parent. It, it, I mean, kindness and compassion and understanding – helping my kids feel loved, help them, them feel like I love them, their mom loves them, they love each other. That's always been the most important thing to me. At some points, I've helped Mike get into counseling support, and I've found experts for him to be meeting with, and I've offered him different resources. But I was, it was always, if you want to try this, you can try this. Some people say that it helps. Mike seems to respond well to that approach. He knows that I'm going to love him no matter what he chooses to do. I mean, if he or resumes drinking and has a real problem with drinking, I'm still going to love him and I'm not going to give up on him and I'm still going to do whatever I can to help him out. It sounds like you were just available you don't know, always available and sounds like you made sure that your kids knew that you were available and that you were open and i mean but the, the whole thing that like about your kids not you know running out the door telling you to screw off or whatnot and sitting and listening to you i mean that blows me away because i i couldn't do that i was always like i don't want to hear this i don't need to hear this and i was out the door yeah. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. was, Leave. Do you remember those kind of like long conversations, Mike? With yeah, I always, um, even if you know these times when I would mess up like that, like I, uh, in it, I think it does help in that situation that he was. I, I respected his work because, like, I, I knew that like that's what he did for work, and you know, when I would meet his colleagues, he seemed to be respected. Yeah. So yeah, for so other for people respect if, him. So. Yeah. If if he. If both of my parents were not in that field and they had a different approach, then I might have been a F you, I'm out of here kid, you know, but uh, no, because he had expertise in, in that, in that uh, realm, I, I, well, I would listen. A lot of things that I learned about parenting, I learned as a child. I felt like it didn't seem like it mattered how I felt or how I was doing in life. I didn't want my kids to go through that. I wanted my kids to know that I would always take time and I was I would always be there for them. It's pretty intuitive of you to, you know, as a kid, pick up on those things and then 
to set out to be a different kind of parent, but then actually be that different kind of parent. Because how many times do we hear about, you know, new parents who are like, I want to raise my child like this because I didn't have this as a kid. And then they end up going through life, not, not following through or not having the self-awareness to recognize harm they could be doing or, or like their reactions to their kids and stuff. So I, I think that's really amazing that like you picked up on that and set out to be a different kind of parent who was really supportive, like the kind of parent that you would have wanted to have. My parents did the best that they could. They did the best that they could with what they knew. And, you know, they were a product of their generation. You, you do what you can. I don't know. Somehow I came out of that and I had these values and priorities that I I live by. And, and, you know, my kids mean the world to me and I want them to feel loved because I, I talk to my families about this when I'm coaching them. Addiction can be such a lonely place to be. And, you know, the isolation, social isolation, loneliness, not feeling understood by anybody, not feeling like you can really talk about things, not feeling like it, even that anyone cares about you. I emphasize these families, when people feel loved, they're capable of amazing accomplishments. It, and having addiction and addiction illness doesn't change that. We, we all need to feel loved. I know when I feel loved, I can conquer the world. And when I go through times where I'm not feeling quite so loved, it's, it's not so easy. Makes me wonder if a, if a lot of parents know how to show that love all the time, right? you know, like, what does that look like? And what do they do? Yeah. I mean, pa parenting is tough. I imagine that's why I'm not a parent, <laughs> but I mean, I can, I can only imagine. It seems like the toughest job in the world. Yeah, it is. Cause you've got, you feel like you've got this, you, you got this huge responsibility, which yeah, you want it. And, and as time goes by, the concerns get a little more, I don't know, important or significant or have more consequences to them. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's challenging. Um, but I've also gained so much from it. Um, and I, um, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be the same person that I am now if I had not been a parent. I'm just so grateful for that, that I've just been blessed because I feel my life has been changed in very deep, profound ways. It's And it's even hard to talk about or to explain it. But every time I hit my birthday, uh, uh, my kids say happy birthday. And, and I say, I feel like I'm the one and I do celebrate your lives, you know, having you in my life is just such a, a blessing and thanks. And I appreciate all that. Uh, but I, I'm always feeling like I, you know, maybe I could be giving more to my kids than I have been. That makes sense. I'm curious how Mike feels about hearing all that from you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I can, uh, yeah, I can imagine it being hard. I don't have any kids. Uh, it's yeah. Like you said, earlier you know you don't have a pamphlet you don't know what to do you just kind of you know react to situations and you try to use what you've learned uh to react well uh maybe using an opposite approach of something you didn't like that your parents did i get it yeah it's it's uh it seems hard that's why that's another i mean that's a reason why i, I you know would just like like to hold stuff in you know like any gripes or something you know like uh uh, I, yeah, but if, pardon me for interrupting you, Mike, but I'd really like to hear them. Well, I want to hear about them. I want to hear about everything, you know, the happy things as well as the sad. And I mean, just so you know where I'm coming from. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, if I become a parent at some point, you know, I like uh, I think a lot of stuff I um you know going back to like you were talking about the dance or whatnot um i don't know i think it's really in i don't know how much on topic this is but it's really like i think s sports played such a role in my life too um 
yeah. just learning about, you know, camaraderie, you know, trust in other people, um, sacrifice uh, for other people, you know, just being learning leadership skills. Like those, those are something that, uh, you know, every kid, every kid should play sports. I feel like I, I learned a lot from playing sports and, you know, just like my favorite memories are you and I throwing the baseball around, you know, like yeah. that's, that's, yeah. that's a million. I, I will say, I feel a million times more of a connection throwing the baseball around than sitting and talking about feelings. <laughs> Right. right. <laughs> you know, like I, I love that. And uh, it, there's a connection to that, you know, like it's, it's like right. the field of dreams, you know, at the end, no. yeah, dad, you want to have a catch? And it's like this unbelievable tearjerker moment, you know, yeah. but there, there's just something really classic Americana about that. And it's just like, it's a camaraderie thing where, you know, nothing needs to be said, but you're just enjoying time together. You're, you know, you're being active, yeah. You know, you're not sitting there watching a game, eating Doritos, you're, you're, you're being active. That's, that's important for life. Um, mm. And that, that goes to like how I treat the gym nowadays, you know, and that's what regulates my life and helps me from drinking. And it, and it's from that sports background and you were, you were big into sports. Like we would go to games together that that's, you know, going to yeah. Red Sox games, Patriots games, uh, Celtics games, like those, that's, that's the best. I still remember, like, I don't know how old I was, but we were at the Boston Garden. When did they tear that down? 1993. And we went with the neighbors, uh, the Creviers, and Paul Crevier was screaming at Shaq while he, <laughs> while he was, uh, you know, like, I don't know, he was probably 10 years old screaming at Shaq when he was on right. the Magic. This was like probably 1992, but I remember right. that. Th- these kind of things regulate your life, and especially, I think, for young boys, young men, I... I, I I'm sure. Yeah, it definitely helps with I'll always remember the best about, you know, childhood. Yeah. W- one thing I've noticed, Mike, is that sometimes you text me and you say, I'm in a real deep mess. And I'm worried about myself. And then I text you back and I say, oh, call me. Um and and you say, well, I can't call now. And then we make a plan that you're going to call me the next day and you don't call me um, <laughs> a lot of times, more times than not. I mean, is there something about you just like texting, reaching out and like speaking your truth and saying, I'm in a really deep pile and I'm worried about myself and then having me re- just reply, acknowledging and I'm here for you. Is there something, I mean, maybe that's all that you need. Maybe you don't necessarily need to have that, you know, phone call conversation the next day. I mean, I've, I've wondered about that. Yeah. Is, yeah. You think that's true? Yeah, totally. Totally. Sometimes I just need to get that out there. I mean, yeah, there's been dark times. There's, um, and just the older I get, the more, intense the lows are it's it's uh yeah just sometimes like if you're like in a real binge or something and you just feel like you're in this hole you can't get out of and then you know my (laughs) my go-to i'll start listening to like alice in chains you know listening to the really dark depressing stuff (laughs) you know when i'm in the like that song literally down in a hole you know uh uh and uh I mean, sometimes I just got to say it. Yeah. And then I'll think about it the next day and I'm like, I don't want to talk about this. Yeah. You know, like I, I just, I don't feel comfortable. Uh, it's just, sometimes and I just got to get it out there though. And it's, and maybe uh, you don't need to talk about it. Yeah. I, 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 I don't, I, I yeah. don't know. I, I don't think so. Um, well, you, you would know. How about the rooster? Yeah, rooster rules. I think you that crank that up and whenever that, <laughs> that comes one's about on. a that's that one's about a POW though, not exactly. Now that song's gonna be stuck <laughs> in my head. <laughs> I think um, you know, texting your dad like that when you're having a hard time or whatnot, when you're like in those depths, I I think it's about like knowing that somebody else knows, you know, and it's like even though you don't talk about it or need to talk about it, it's like okay, they know. Somebody knows, and if I want to talk about it, you know, you you can. It's like, yeah, 
sometimes right. you know it's just that i will i will text him and i'll be like yeah you know i'm i'm down in a hole <laughs> and then the yeah. next morning i just lift the heaviest weight i can possibly pick up and i'm fine like there's there's something about that release of lifting weights it's like it's euphoric it's it's the yeah best therapy you could i could ever have i i mean like you know i i got into therapy young uh yeah Yeah. and you know i felt like it helped me a lot when i was young and then i tried going to therapy a few times like as an adult i couldn't find the right person and then also i just felt like i felt like i was sitting there just being a just complaining you know it's tough sometimes yeah it's i i just don't i for me at this point in my life maybe it's because i i did it so much when i was younger i just i don't i've i've found other ways to deal with it yeah um that like and i said the lifting weights is the number one um i i don't like to sit there in the chair and talk about my problems for an hour with this stranger right i don't well, know you, you also love music right yeah and, and you love pro wrestling yeah and, so you've got your outlets. Yeah, these are my. These are therapeutic for you. Yeah, big time. They they heal you. They they give you some relief, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, one thing I'll say, a nice memory. We always had music playing in the house when we were raising our kids, and I mean, even if we had yard work to do, we'd have the music outside and we'd be listening to rock blocks of classic rock. And, you know, all of a sudden your favorite song would come up, Alice in Chains or Guns N' Roses, Metallica, and you hear three in a row by them. And it's like, you know, it gets you psyched. And all of a sudden you get some energy and you can, you know, work another half an hour or so. Um, Yeah. But we always had, music on in that house and it just i don't and you both my kids love music and i love music and that's therapeutic for me yeah I, yeah that's uh sorry to cut you off there i just want to say this one thing like you know at the time i hated it so much doing that yard work but now when those certain songs come on it brings me immediately back there and they're good memories now you know we'd be painting the house it was hot as hell and I hated it, but you know, oh, yeah. like you said, that the it it gets you through, and that that was another bonding thing, you know, throwing the ball around, but also you know, uh, rock music that was a a big thing in our house. Yeah, yeah, I've I've always been pretty. Uh, I like what I like, and if I you know, yeah, and if I get it, like I'm not, I'm very easy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that, and like like another birthday, just like I watched college football and I watched Roadhouse, and that was like I don't know, I <laughs> might have so I might have been twenty at that point, but that was like one of my favorite birthdays ever. Super yeah. easy to please. Yeah, well, one thing that hits me is how I mean, Mike, you 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 don't go by any of the rules of of like recovery from addiction you know you're not going to any mutual support organizations you're not in therapy you're not going to an iop you're not taking medication um and you're lifting weights and you've got this what did you say on the best you've got this mantra that you keep repeating to yourself i'm the best and you don't talk to your dad when you're down in a hole. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you may text him, but you don't really have a conversation. Um, but it works for you. And and that's something that I've learned from you. I've learned a lot of things from you. But one of the things I've learned is that you, when people pick out, when people identify the things that are right for them, that's when they do well. And there's no one way to do well. You know, therapy works for some people. Other things work for other people. And you've got your own kind of way of being healthy, gaining health and recovery. Sometimes I'll get those messages from you and I'll tell my partner about it. Oh, Mike's having a hard time. My partner says, well, did you call him? And I said, no. And she said, well, 
you got to call him. He <laughs> wants to be called, doesn't he? And I say, I don't think he does. I mean, <laughs> I've done that a lot in the past. And I, so I wrote back and I said, do you want to talk now? And he says, no, maybe tomorrow. And I say, okay. And as you know, I'm here 24 seven. I'll come down. I'll drive down to New York city. If you need me anytime, you know that, right? And he'll write back, right. And then my partner says, you got to call him. Why, why aren't you calling him? And I say, I think it's okay. I'm not sure, but I think, I think it's, a, it's what he wants and he knows he can ask. And it's true. And, but it's, so for my partner, it's, it's hard for her to wrap her head around that. Like, and I think sometimes she thinks I'm not being a good parent or that I should be doing more. Um, and it's, so I'm trying to explain to her, I don't know. It's just, I, I just believe that it, it, it might needs to make those decisions and it seems to be working, you know? Yeah. I, I, I think, uh, I've always kind of, uh, went to the beat of my own drum. Um, I, I don't like rules. I don't like society <laughs> in, yeah, in, a, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> I, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot I don't like, and I, I definitely don't like going traditional routes of anything. Right. Uh, it's just, just not yeah. my nature. It probably has a lot to do with going to Catholic school and hating it. And uh, just, <laughs> just like church or anything, you know, like just these things that I didn't want to do. And I did. And it's just, yeah. it's made me, uh, I have a, uh, uh, an iconoclast streak in me. So I, I, I try to, I don't know. Yeah, I just, I, I just try to do, I try to figure out what works. I don't know. And yeah, I, I don't think, uh, you do you. Yeah. Right? And you like you. those, uh, those meetings worked, you know, to an extent, what was that called again? The, uh, smart, smart recovery work. yeah those work to an extent yeah. and then uh i went to china and then the pandemic happened like when i was in china and then i just never went back and uh and and they i i'm sure they did like zoom or something but i just never went back and i liked talking about it in the crowd but i didn't necessarily like to hear everybody else's stuff um <laughs> yeah <laughs> i can't well, relate to that. I mean, what, the 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 message is whatever works, yeah. and you know, if you you don't have to believe in a higher power, you don't have to you don't have to have a social connection necessarily. Um, I mean, d different things work for different people. We're all unique. We're all individual, and to herd everyone like cattle on this path that is supposed to work for everybody, and that's the only path that's going to work. If we haven't learned that that doesn't work by now, when are we ever going to learn that? Yeah. It's pretty amazing, though. I mean, considering that, you know, you went to school for this, Patrick, and for years, you know, the one of the main resources for everybody was 12 steps and everything. But yet, you know, like you that wasn't pushed on Mike. You didn't push that on him or anything. Whereas most pe parents don't know what to do. So they just. Right take whatever they can grab and then they push that, you know, and, and right. everybody in that community is also pushing that. Yeah. So, but it, I like think sometimes I hear from parents, they say he doesn't have a sponsor. They're, they're talking, talking about their own family. I'm work. I'm supporting them through coaching. And they say, I'm really upset. He hasn't gotten a sponsor. And I, and I say, Oh, okay. I get it. You're upset. You'd like him to have a sponsor. What <laughs> else is he doing? And then they tell me all these other things that he's doing, w which are really positive and healthy. And I say, okay, well, I don't know, but if he, I'm hearing a lot of positivity in this and if he can do that, and if he'd rather not pursue the sponsor now, I don't know that it's a problem. And so a, lo a lot of the work that I do with families is, is educating them of how to find the positives that we see in people that we're worried about, how to support that and how to reinforce that and and to try to put aside our own ideas about what's going to work for them. And not like not focus on the one negative thing that they think might be going on. You know, like they're doing this and this and this and this is all good, but he doesn't have a sponsor. Yeah. Like people focus on yeah. the bad stuff. Wow. Yeah. 
I think you went back to your roots, though, Mike. I mean, from what it sounds like to me, I mean, with the sports and everything that you had as a kid and like the structure that that brought, I mean, that's what you kind of went back to. Like, that's your, that's your, ah, story, you know? That's a good point. I actually didn't think of that. Uh, because, yeah, when, when I first moved to New York, like, and I, I wanted to be a fashion designer, I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be this massive thing, right? I, I, I loved like, Galliano, I loved Rick Owens. I wanted to be like a, a a goth heavy metal Galliano, you know. Right. And I wanted to just I I didn't care about having of like a family of my own. I didn't care about anything other than that. <clears throat> and I wanted to be this like big massive thing. And I just looked at my life as very complicated. I'm a complicated person, and like I I don't know I I. Like that's kind of how I thought when I first came here, and then over time, you know, you burn yourself out. Things don't go the right way, uh, and then, you know, in the last few years, I don't know if it's just getting older in your mid thirties or whatever, but I I've just tried to simplify my life. Like it's not like being famous is like not important. Like I wanted to be famous. Like I wanted to be, you know, a, a this. Like I said, just this star. I wanted to be a star. Right. Yep. I, I don't, I don't, I stopped caring about that. Uh, fashion became a very just, um, I, I stopped caring about it, it part, partially because of my experience in it, in the, in the business realm of it and how, how tough it is to start your own business. Um, and I just wanted, I wanted to simplify my life. What, what do I like? I like, I like to, lift weights I, I like to um i like to watch wrestling i like to you know possibly learn how to run my own business you know uh restaurants were never my dream it was always something i did on the side while i was going to do something else and then i got the opportunity that i have now and i'm doing pretty well um and i mean it's i don't it's this wasn't ever my dream but i'm i'm learning how to run a business from the inside you know, I lift weights, I have my wife, you know, that's, and I, and I watch wrestling. You love your wife, right? Of course. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to make it sound like she's just an appendage. Or no, anything. no, 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 no. <laughs> like I'm saying, these are like kind of, I don't know, someone would say regular things, you know, but I've, I've found happiness in a simplicity now. Yeah, like, you yeah. Gotta, don't you need all the really drama and chaos and all the. Yeah, I wanted to live yeah. a chaotic life. Yeah. I wanted to live a rock star lifestyle. Yep. You know, like I wanted to be Axl Rose in fashion. You know, <laughs> like, like, mm. and mm. and it just it it didn't bring me any happiness. Um, and yeah, like like you said, I've gotten to my roots, to kind of sports giving a uh, structure, and just trying to you know find a career, make some money, and just live simply i have a feeling that you'll move out of new york in like five years yeah probably <laughs> just putting a random prediction out there but. yeah well, we almost I, did we were looking into new jersey recently but we found a good oh. apartment here and that's hard to find in new york as far as i know so yeah let me throw out one thing that i've learned about mike and about um, so uh, Mike, uh, our listeners probably have gotten a sense that Mike doesn't really follow a conventional path forward, you know, educational, academic, vocational career, whatever. Um, and so what I've learned, um, so sometimes Mike comes up with different ideas and, um, he was going to be a stand up comedian. That was going to be his career. Um, he was a, a carpenter in the union and did quite well with that he was a fashion designer et cetera, et cetera. and and so sometimes i've what i've learned is uh in mike you'll probably remember this sometimes you'll come up um oh, you're going to get married to this woman that i just met uh and i say mike um i'm sure you'll land on your feet and i support you 100 percent. and let me know how i can help and so that's always worked. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I think, um, I think we should probably wrap up. I don't want you to miss out on your gym time. 
I yeah, I gotta, yeah, I gotta do that. I gotta, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I was gonna ask Patrick if there was like one tip that he'd recommend, but there's tons of tips that you mentioned. Um, Mike, if there was like one thing you'd say to somebody out there struggling, like, what what would you say? Um, I would say try to have a plan and go with a shorter time frame. Like I said, don't try to, uh, you know, oh, I'm never drinking again. How many people have said that in their lives when they were puking from the night before and then they drink that night or something? I don't know. It's just, it's, it just for me, it was just an, an inconceivable amount of time. I know a lot of people do that. I don't know if I'm going to like drink regularly again. I don't know if I could ever possibly handle that, but what I give myself short times, you know, six weeks, even three months, you know, and just getting to that goal, being goal oriented, uh, you know, and just going day by day. Uh, that's, that's all I could say from my experience. Keep it short and try to hit a short goal. Get some W's. Stop taking L's. <laughs> and as you also brought up earlier, Mike, 90% of life is just showing up. Yeah, which I I I tell myself that every day when I get out of bed, you know, I say, okay, if I can just get out of bed, then I'll take a step, and then I'll take another step. Then once you show up in for life, you see it's generally not that difficult, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely build things up in my head a lot worse than they're ever going to be. So yeah, like you went to the court and you paid your fines from the DWI and the judge talked to you you had a pleasant conversation the judge you know you had a you hit it off with the judge you didn't expect that you know you show it up and yeah. it worked right yeah short achievable goals that each person can accomplish whether it's going out the door you know for people with social anxiety and or going out the door and then walking down the block yeah i don't know small small things do help yep all right. Um, Patrick, let's tell everybody how people can find you. Thank you so much to Mike for sharing your truth to the world. I really appreciate that. And it takes a lot of courage. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me. And Amanda, thanks so much for guiding us on this this journey here. It's great having you at the helm, at the wheel, steering the bus. And people can reach me at familyaddictioncoach.com. And also at Patrick at familyaddictioncoach.com. Thank you both for getting together and having this conversation with me. Like, I really wanted to get you both together to to do this. So I'm really this was glad fun. we could make it work. Yeah, the, and, yeah this was fun. This is fun. And, and the third time's a charm. Is that the expression? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> we did it. We did it. Yeah. Go team. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. That brings us to the end of this episode. As always, thanks for listening to Family Addiction Coaching. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And if you found this episode helpful, please ask two friends to give it a listen. Be sure to come back for the next Pro Tips episode. For more insider information you won't get anywhere else, and check out the other episodes. Until then, this is Patrick Doyle, and you can find me at familyaddictioncoach.com. <laughs>